Our first conversation was with Robert Lightfoot. He's acting administrator for NASA. He's been the agency's associate administrator since 2012 and first joined NASA nearly three decades ago. Before that, he was head of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And here to lead the conversation is Atlantic Live contributor, Allison Stewart. Allison, take it away. So we've decided to go with first names, Robert. Yep. That so uh, 2033, it's mid-May 2017, that's about 15 and a half years. So, but 15 and a half years ago, if you had said to somebody, I'm going to tweet to my million followers from my iPhone, people would not know what you were talking about. So 15 years is a long time. The question is, as one person put it, there's nothing technically impossible about putting a man on Mars. That's correct, right? There's a few challenges, but no, it's not impossible. You've talked about the little M's to get to the big M's. What are the four phases that you've laid out that you believe will get us there? Yeah, I think for us, the, when we talk about the big M, the big M is actually getting to Mars. That's the big mission, and it takes several little missions along the way to get there, and they're not little, by the way. <laughs> um, my guys would be irritated with me for saying that, but, but really what, the way we're looking at it is we're looking at using low Earth orbit today, space station. Uh, the International Space Station is kind of our linchpin for the initial beginnings of technologies that we need to do, learning about the human body. Um, you think about what Scott Kelly did with the one-year mission so we can understand um, what happens to the human body in the microgravity environment. You'll have Mike Lay up here later, mm -hmm. and he can, I'm sure he'll be able to share some of that as well. Um, but that's an important piece, the technologies you need to demonstrate, life support systems, things like that. So that's kind of the low Earth orbit, the area 200 miles above your head. We've been up there for a while. You can see it go over. If you haven't ever seen it, it's the brightest, brightest star in the sky. Um, that's kind of a proving ground for us locally. We're also using that to enable the commercial industry. We've got SpaceX, Orbital ATK, and, and, and Boeing, all participating in ways to, to bring things to the, to the space station, kind of trying to get this industrial base in the country going to support all these steps, because we need them to. Bigelow is up there with an a, a expandable module on the station. Again, testing systems out that we're going to need. The next phase will be somewhere in the vicinity of the moon, where we can take these systems out, we can do a, a, a shakedown of them, kind of building the infrastructure we're going to need. If you can think about a, a highway system here in the United States, that, inf that interstate system, you need a system that allows us to travel back and forth. So we're going to test those out around the moon, and, then hope, and that's kind of what we're going to do in the decade of the 2020s, build the systems we need to do that for a longer duration than just on station, and then ultimately we'll press to Mars. Um, and in the meantime, we, while we're working today, we're still working on technologies for landing on Mars, even though we're in these three phases. So this is what we're doing. Let me unpack a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, tell me what you believe will be the long-term impact of the um, uh, of private partnerships coming in with NASA. Yeah, I think for me, I've been talking about it being a big and for a while. It's not, it's not an or. A lot of people want to drive you into an or. And I think the longer-term impact will be Similar to what we saw in Apollo, there's a whole industrial, industrial base that we'll build in this country, and that's, to me, economic security for the country, uh, as well as it is, we don't know what we're going to learn yet, right? This is, this is definitely a journey, not a destination, and every, every step along the way, we're learning things that not just support us to get to Mars, but they support us here on Earth, and I think that's the, that's the part that'll come out of this that'll be fascinating. Why do you think people go to the or rather than the and? I think it's easy, right? I think it's easy to just go to the or because we're kind of a competitive society. Um, and I think what we're trying to do here, this grand challenge of trying to put humans on Mars and just, just even pushing humans deeper into space than we've ever done before, if you think about that, it's going to take the international community, it's going to take the best of our industries in this country, and it's going to take the government investment piece of that as well. So I think, I think, it's just, I think the, the enormity of the tasks that we have in front of us is what's going to take all of us. How will the international community come into this discussion? Yeah, they're, they're already in the discussion. We use them on the International Space Station. We have 15 countries there today. Uh, helping us with that. It's, that's proven to us to, as a good model for how you do global engagement and diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, NASA is kind of a soft power in that area, and it's been actually fascinating to watch how that has played out over the years we've been on station. We, we are talking to the international partners constantly about our, our journey to Mars and what we're trying to do from that perspective, and they have niche areas they would like to participate, and so that's what we're, that's what we're talking to them about. What are those conversations? What are those niche areas? Oh, well, you've got You've got uh, the, the Europeans clearly like, they like the idea of going to the moon, right? Mm -hmm. But the systems they would like to come with us as we go, that's what they've talked about for a while. They have strength in uh, building structures, the nodes that we have on station were built by the Italians. 
um, the, the shells were by the Italians. The Russians clearly have engagement with us on the station today, um, providing transportation, but also some of the systems that we use on station. The Japanese have been involved with us on a bunch of areas, and from an experimental perspective, they've expressed interest to us in life support systems, long-term life support systems we may need. I mean, that's just some of the examples. You made a little news over the weekend. There was some discussion. The mm -hmm. president wanted to have a manned, uh, a pot wanted you to research that possibility of putting a man as part of the SLS Orion rocket going mm -hmm. out in 2019, is it 2019? Mm -hmm. And you decided to study that. Tell me what exactly you were studying. Yeah, I mean, first we, we know what the answer is. First, it's crude, not manned. Crude, sorry. Let's be really crew. careful here. Sorry. Because uh, I don't want to assume. Yes, I'm uh, a garden variety journalist, not a space journalist, so Got please, it. please. So crude mission. No, uh, what Correct. we were at, the administration asked us when they first came on board, could we put crew on EM-1, Exploration Mission 1 for us, which is the first launch of uh, the Space Launch System in Orion. Um, we did a good study on that, took a long look at it, and really why it's technically feasible when you looked at the overall plan and the resources that were needed, the schedule that was going to be needed, um, and, and then some of the increase in technical risk, it really just kind of reaffirmed the plan we were on, is, is we need to fly the first mission uncrewed, um, and then that'll, that'll make the second mission with the crew much more, much more safe. It's a better, better risk reduction strategy for us going forward for the, for the longer term of what we're trying to do. Can you tell us a little more about those risks? Yeah, the, um, one of the things that we had planned on when you're doing a test flight, uh, you, can, you can get a lot of data back that'll give you some confidence. The heat shield, for instance, on the Orion spacecraft, we, we really needed the test flight to test that. We could have done some things on the ground, but we probably would have never gotten to the level of risk reduction that we would prefer. Could have gotten there. It was definitely feasible. Uh, the software, just getting the software done, we, had, we don't have the software for the displays and the activities that the, the crew needs. Mm -hmm. We'd have to turn those on pretty quickly and get them going. And then really... The, the big one is the life support system associated with the, uh, with the test. Finally, the, 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 probably the biggest piece was with an uncrewed mission, we can really test the system. We're going to run a pretty aggressive mission profile. If we had crew for the first time, we would go in a much uh, kind of a, we'd go to a high Earth orbit, make sure all the systems are working, and then go out toward the moon. We don't have to worry about that with no crew. We're just going to take it straight to the moon and, and, and test the system. It's a pretty, pretty rigorous test, and we thought that was the better way to go. When you say aggressive, what does that mean? Uh, it just means that we're going to, um, we're going to, I don't want to imply that EM-1 is, doesn't have some risk to it. I mean, we're, we're pushing the envelope here. We haven't done this. And, and so what we want to do is take the Orion spacecraft and test it as hard as we can. In other words, we're going to have the highest return velocity we can get from the moon, which is the big test of the heat shield. Mm -hmm. So that when we put crew on the next mission, we'll have confidence in that system. One of the numbers that I read, and, and please, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that it might have cost an extra 600 to $900 million. Where would that money have gone? Well, it, it would have gone to the systems I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of the money was already planned for the next mission, and we would have had to accelerate it and bring it forward to, to do that. But some of the others was for some extra testing we wanted to do, specifically around the heat shield, um, getting the software team on board quicker, mm -hmm. th those kind of activities. So it was really some testing ascent abort. We were going to do an ascent abort test after exploration mission one, we would have had to pull it forward to do it before. So it was really as much as phasing thing. But I, you know, cost really to me, it was more the integrated look at the cost, the schedule, and the technical risk we were taking. And just, again, it reaffirmed those plans that we already had in place. Something that's sort of interesting and rare these days is that the funding for this program and for that bill had huge bipartisan support, mm -hmm. something we don't see a lot of these days. Why do you think that is? Huh, that's a great question. Uh, we've been pretty blessed by that. The, the administration and the Congress have supported NASA for a while, and I think people look at NASA as a um, uh, we look at they look at it as a symbol of leadership for the country, right? It's a, it's a good thing. Um, if you look at our social media presence and the team, our team does a great job, um, really reaching out to the public and, and showing the public what we're doing, and, and we get tremendous interest. I mean, anywhere from if you go back to Trappist One, where we discovered the Earth-like planets. Four billion hits on social media for that, right? Um, you just see a, a, a tremendous amount of presence in terms of what we're trying to do because we're trying to really, you know, we're, we're basically changing textbooks, you know, and, and I think that pursuit of knowledge and that scientific discovery um, really intrigues uh, most people that this is a good thing. It's not, a, it's not you know, it's, it's different than some of the other things people talk about in the government. You sound very enthused. There's many people who are scientists say that science is under assault in many parts of the world. Yeah, I don't, but you sound enthused about this. I, I'm very enthused. I think, I think it's optimistic, I guess. Yeah, I, I think we've got a great plan. I think you see how NASA did. 
Um, in the 2018 skinny budget that came out, we did really well compared to a lot of other agencies. And I think, again, it's, that, it's a value proposition that we bring um, not only for the nation, but really globally. Um, that, that what we're trying to do, you know, it's kind of, I like to say it's written in our hearts, right? This is, this is what we, we want to be, we want to explore. We want to push forward. And I think NASA is the, probably the symbolic piece of that. NASA and, our, and our, all our partners, academia, this industry in this country is ready to push forward. I mean, that's so, so, so exciting about it. You see people just get really enthusiastic about what we're trying to do. That number, that $19.5 billion, is that enough? I think it's, I think it's for us, for our plans, it will help us. We will be our plans with that number. Really? Yep. You're never going to hear anybody at NASA go, we, we don't want any more. <laughs> I mean, that's not, that's not the way we're going to be. But, but for us, for what we ask for, this is, a, this is exactly what we need to go do the job we've been asked to go do. Well, here's a question. If, if you could have unlimited funding <laughs> to, to throw at this, what, where would it go immediately? Yeah, and how I, would that affect I mean, I, what we would do the time is, frame? Yes. So there's a couple of things that we would do. We would, ex, we would uh, accelerate some of the risk reduction activities we need to do, which is, means we'd start building hardware earlier. Um, than we are planning right now. Right now we're very phased. Like you said earlier, it's a very phased approach and we could probably accelerate some of that. Um, but that would be the area that we would, that we would focus on is just accelerating that hardware we need. We need, a, we need that infrastructure system around the moon, which is a habitat, and then a, a, a way to transport folks from there to Mars, right? And, that's, and landers when we get there. I mean, these are, these are complex systems that we would prop, could we accelerate um, moving forward, but we're not going to accelerate that much. I think it's just, I think we've got a good steady approach based on the resources we've been given. I'm pretty confident we can do it. Tell me a little bit about uh, what you see as the agenda for POTUS 45 versus 44 and 43. You've been at NASA for nearly 30 years now, so give us a little bit of hindsight there. Yeah, I see what I've seen so far is, is um, support for what we're trying to do. Um, I think that's, that's to me, I, I've seen a con with the signing of the 2017 Transition Authorization Act, and you're going to have Senator Cruz here later. He and Senator Nelson were the two stalwarts behind getting that done. And um, when the president signed that, that gave us constancy of purpose, is what we like to say. Just a continuation of what we've been doing for a while. And I think, honestly, Allison, that's, that's the, the one thing we need. When you're talking multi-decadal mm -hmm. kind of programs like we're doing here and what we're trying to do, um, you need that stability over time. And, it, and if you think about the International Space Station, I forget how many it is, but there's 30 some odd heads of states that changed, administrators change, and, you, and, and you've got to have that constancy of purpose to allow you to be doing these long-term programs. Um, and that's what we saw from the administration so far and obviously from Congress with what they did with the uh, 17 Omnibus. Did you have that stability previously? We, I think we've always had that stability. Uh, that's one thing NASA's been able to, to survive through multiple... Um, administrations for this reason. That's why the station's up there. The station took a long time to, the International Space Station took a long time to build. This next transportation agenda we have will take a long time to build as well. When you talk about the space station, it's obviously a source of pride. Mm -hmm. uh, what made it successful and what can you learn from <laughs> it that you can apply to this plan for Mars? Yeah, I think uh, the, the, for us, the station is kind of our, it's, it, it is our right now it's our shining star up there so they're jumping off platform and and we're learning so much there the engineering marvel that it is i i you know when we landed on the moon that was an incredible thing that was an incredible event i call it a civilization level changing event right um when you when you look at the station it's just incredible what we do every day we're operating in space we've been there for a while we've got peggy whitson up there right now who's the longest serving person on the longest time in space cumulative time in space uh, just short of Mike L.A. for EVA now. Uh, he's still got her beat there. Still got the record. Yeah, he's still got, <laughs> still got her beat. I'm sure she's coming after him. Uh, <laughs> but, but, and then you've got, a, you've got a rookie like Jack Fisher on there with, with her, right? For, and, and then the international partners. So what we've learned is we can cooperate internationally. Mm -hmm. We can survive a lot of things that are happening here on Earth. And they don't seem to affect us in our ability to cooperate in space. Um, and we cooperate for the right reasons. I think we're trying to all, again, it's all about that pursuit of knowledge, that, that scientific discovery that we're trying to do, whether it's the human body or whether it's just science in general. So that's what we've learned is that you can do this. You can actually pull off a very complex engineering uh, challenge. Well, what errors or what missteps or, wow, we could have done that better on the ISS that you can apply? Yeah, I'm sure there's several. Um, I think I, I would say for the most part, Nothing, nothing big, obviously, because we're up there. Um, I think the, 
that there, we have day-to-day -day challenges. I mean, you can see the, just the spacewalk we did this past week. The teams did an incredible job recovering that spacewalk. It was going to be a lot shorter and not get as much done, but the teams come together and have a great process. I would call it just the day-to-day -day things that we have to do. They aren't errors. They just show the skill set of our people and what our people can do when they're faced with a challenge. Because it's hard to operate, you know, 200 feet, 200 miles above us here um, in the vacuum of space, and you watch them do it every day. Um, I think, it, you know. One of the best things we've done is, is bring the commercial entities to bring our cargo to station. When we retired the space shuttle, we now have Orbital ATK and SpaceX bringing us cargo to station on a pretty routine basis. And it's a very resilient process that we've got going, even though we've had some incidents there. So you can see that we've got a supply chain now. We've got a kind of building this, this industrial base as we go forward. And I think that's the part that's been the most successful around ISS. When you think about deep space exploration, do you think about it in terms of study, or do you think about Mars in terms of settlement? Well, I think it's a go-do. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a study. Uh, we, stu <laughs> we, we studied it for a long time, and uh, I, I feel like for, for probably, at least in my career, I feel like the, the momentum is there. I mean, the teams are ready to go. A lot of people in this room are on those teams, um, and they really like that horizon destination, right? And we got a lot of work to go to get there. But uh, I think most people realize we can, not only can we do it, we will do it, right? If we keep, if we just keep that constancy of purpose. And so to me, I, I hope, you know, I hope we can make the Martian the movie, the Martian the reality mm -hmm. uh, going forward. And I think that's what, I think that's what our teams are striving to do today. What do you think of that movie? I thought it was great. Yeah. I, well, I, as I told people, I said, uh, my, my wife made me I probably shouldn't. Stephanie's going to shoot me here, but I, I, uh, <laughs> Stephanie, my, my wife, person. my wife uh, made me bring all our neighbors, and so I'm the only one that works at NASA. So the movie was more questions. I was like, "Can I just watch what? the movie?" <laughs> <laughs> I just kept. Oh, anyway, what did they want to know? That, is that real? Could that, that happen? Real? Can that go on? And you know, it was it was interesting. I, I, I um, enjoyed. I enjoyed seeing it because there's a lot of the pieces, you know, Andy Weir worked with NASA quite a bit, mm -hmm. so it was it was pretty realistic in terms of what the challenges are. I think the part that, that was interesting was there was already a lot of stuff there at Mars that we're trying to build now, and I said, that's not fair. They started with it already there. <laughs> so, so, it was, so it was good, but, but it was, it, I thought it was a pretty good ad ad adaptation of what we, what we expect to do. This is a little bit of a, a softball question, but how does pop culture fit into your world? Yeah, does I think, it affect it at all? Or does I, it I, th I don't know if it affects it so much. I think it's a good way for us to engage with the public mm -hmm. in a different way than maybe we would have in the past. And uh, we, we enjoy, I mean, all of us, we're, I mean, at some level, the folks that work at NASA, this is as much a hobby as it is a job, right? Because we love what we get to do every day. And I think being involved with the pop culture is it, those movies, you know, I've had people ask me if we've been to, uh, what is it, Pandora? I'm like, no, you know, from Avatar. And all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so. Uh, not not since I've been there. And so, so I mean, so so it, you, you get a lot of that kind of you get a lot of that kind of questions. But for the most part, you know, I, I'll give you an example. My daughter called me just this weekend and said, "Have you seen Interstellar?" The, you know, the mm -hmm. Matthew McConaughey. Um, and and she immediately turns the phone and gives it to a friend of hers who's just, uh, probably as big a geek as me, right? And this person starts asking me all these questions about it. I'm like, "Oh my God." I don't know, right? Just from that standpoint, I enjoyed the movie just like you did. I try to go to the movie to watch the movie, uh, but there, but there's a, the the inevitable questions that you'll get from that standpoint. But I think it's a very important piece of what we how we engage with the mm -hmm. public and what we're doing. And our comms team, I, I give them a lot of credit. They have been able to probably expand that gap from the, you know, the the old rigid engineer to talking to folks that don't know what we're doing so much. And I think that's an important way for us to communicate with the public in terms of what we're doing. And they've they've done a great job doing that. Make it more real. You know, down to earth, no pun intended. <laughs> we need to have a pun jar for this yeah. whole afternoon. <laughs> when I was watching the movie Hidden Figures, one of the things that struck me was the, and I know obviously this is a plot device, but that idea of the race, the idea of you mentioned how we are competitive beings and wanting to be first. And that was sort of a galvanizing thing. It's what everybody could surround themselves around. What is it about the Mars mission that we can, that we can get everyone uh, engaged with and surround and, ch and cheer for and root for? Yeah, way. and first of all, it was a great movie, wasn't it? it I mean, was it was a fantastic movie, um, and and just incredible story of some fantastic women down at down at Langley Research Center in Virginia. So, really proud to see that that get done. I th I think for us, the 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 rallying cry is again, I think it's that civilization and human aspect of we need to keep exploring, 
it's kind of in our DNA. We want, mm -hmm. we want to learn more. We want to push more. And, and for me, I think Mars is the place to go. I think that's what we should do. And I think most of our team is, is ready to try to do it. It's going to be tough, right? This is not going to be easier. We would already done it. Uh, but, but it is going to, and it's going to take that constancy of purpose. And I think, um, you know, if you, if you just fast forward, right. And you think for those of you that were there when we, when we walked on the moon, can you imagine the first steps on Mars? You know, and somebody has walked on Mars. Can you imagine how that's going to feel? And I remember seeing, we, we, we looked at all the headlines. Somebody sent this to me, all the headlines when, we, when, we, when Neil Armstrong took that first step on, on the moon. And globally, it was, we did it, right? It was the human race that pulled that off, not just, the, not just NASA, not just the U.S. It was, the, it was a global, like, like I said, civilization level change event for us. And I think that to me, that's the, that's the thing you'll see when we, when we walk on Mars. I mean, I really believe that. So that's what I think is important. We've got about four minutes left. I'm going to ask one more question and then open it up to the audience for questions. So think about this. I'm the, this is just a personal question. Where were you when, uh, do you remember the moon landing? Uh, yeah, I do. I was very, very young, uh, but I was alive. I was. Uh, I, I will do that. So, uh, yeah, I, was, I remember watching with my dad, right? And my dad, who happens to be my hero, um, you know, he's the one that went out and started building model rockets after that and, and mm -hmm. drug me out there with him. I can remember thinking, what are we doing? But <laughs> anyway, so he laughs, he laughs to this day because he's got pictures of me fly, flying an old Saturn V Estes model rocket that uh, I was clearly not interested. I was over digging, <laughs> I was over digging in the dirt. And so uh, the first picture he ever had of a shuttle launch that, that uh, I was involved in, he said, this is, he, had, he, had, he built one of these pictures of me at the shuttle launch and this picture of me digging in the dirt and said, he said, I guess I planted some seeds, Aww. you know, so anyway, but, but I think, yeah, I remember that. And I remember, you know, I, probably one of the most favorite time in my career was, um, Neil Armstrong came to Huntsville to, to speak at an event and I got to sit and eat dinner with him because oh, wow. I, and, and it was like, wow, I told my, I told my guys at the, at the, uh, the photographers, I said, you better get a picture. <laughs> right? I got to have a picture of this. So it was, so it was great because you hear the stories and when you talk to people like that, very humble, very, um, you know, almost, almost this reality, the same reality we're in today. You, I tell my guys all the time, you know, you're making history. You just don't know it, right? Because if you go back and ask the Apollo guys, you know, what, did you know you were making history? And they'll say, no, I was just doing my job, right? And so when you look back, there is a historical aspect that comes into play. And that, to me, is the other piece I try to pull on with our teams. Mm -hmm. Questions from the audience? Hi. Hi, my name is Marshall Banks, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Can you talk about the status of an asteroid redirect mission and whether it is going to go forward or not? Yeah, I think we're, going to, we're, we're planning on not going forward with the asteroid redirect mission. And we're, but, but the key for the asteroid redirect mission is we're going to take advantage of the technologies we develop, the solar electric propulsion um, effort that we have. Uh, that, that has actually proven to be a technology we can use in this journey to Mars. Um, and I think we're going to continue that. Uh, as we go forward. So I know the technology guys will keep doing this. We call it SEP, solar electric propulsion. They'll keep doing the SEP work for sure. We're going to complete that because we need it on a bus we're going to use for part of our uh, infrastructure that we're building as we go to Mars. It's actually a really awesome system that we can use now. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, John Wetmore with pedestrians.org. Uh, what does your unmanned uh, exploration of Mars look like? It's different if you're preparing for a manned mission, then if there's no manned mission on the horizon, what do you do differently? That's a great question. So let me see if I got your, if I didn't have the human mission to Mars, what would I do scientifically? Is that what? Your, your, the difference your, between the your, two. Your unmanned probes. You oh, know, you have okay. a long series of them going back many years. Yep. What do you do differently going forwards if you're preparing for yeah. man versus nothing in sight? Yeah, great question. Um, and and uh, Ellen Stofan, who's after me, can talk a little bit about the science we've been doing. But what we did, on Curiosity, the one that's, the rover that's on Mars now, we added a radiation uh, sensor to that particular mission so we could understand better the radiation environment because we're worried about what that would do for humans. On 2020, we're adding a, um, an instrument called MOXIE, which is going to hopefully pull oxygen out of the atmosphere of, uh, of, of Mars, and so we can see if we can actually reproduce it. It's almost an in-situ resource utilization kind of experiment that's going to go on there. So those are the, we're starting to talk about space we can use on these spacecraft that go for science missions. Can we actually designate some space to get ready for the human mission? Hopefully that answered your question. I think we have time for one more. 
Aida Awad, Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow. Uh, recognizing that earlier NASA missions made a tremendous impact on encouraging students to follow their path in STEM, what would you recommend to STEM educators as a message to students now to be involved in programs in the next, up to 2033? That's a great question. Um, I, I think for me, the way, what, I, what I hope we do is I hope we, it's, it's, we, we've talked about encouraging kids to stay in STEM for a while. I think we also need to talk about retaining kids that actually get interested in STEM. I, what I've seen quite often is when it gets hard, we sometimes, uh, the, the kids will walk, walk away, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, it's, I think the retention piece of this is something I really want people to encourage. If there's a spark, we ought to just keep fanning it, right? And don't let them walk away, because they'll walk away, right? I mean, I watched it with my, one of my daughters. It just kills me. She should be an engineer. She walked away, because it got hard, right? And I think that's where you need that encouraging piece um, going forward. And to me, that was the, um, that's what I, I think we have a great effort in this country to keep STEM on the forefront, keep people, in, to get people interested in STEM. I think the next step we need to take is now how do we get them to stay there? That's my take. And that's a great place to end. All right. Join me in welcoming, thanking Robert Lightfoot. All right. Thanks, Allison. Thank you.